more to English than Washington. <coughs> uh, Premiums and co-payments uh, for workers are soaring, and as Senator Stefano probably has said many times, I know GM has said many times, $1,500 of the cost of a car goes to health care. So um, today we we'll focus um, our discussion about the future of the employer uh, based system. We have a great paper by Len Nichols, um, which uh, talks about the, uh, the threats of health care costs to competitiveness. That's a of U.S. businesses in the global economy. Uh, to start us off, uh, Senator Stavnow has graciously agreed to um, give us her thoughts on this. Um, so we will start with her. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Lori, and to uh, Len Nichols and Elizabeth Carpenter. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for all your great work. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm here, uh, first of all, today to say it's nice to uh, be joined by the data in something that I have been uh, talking about for a long time. Uh, because uh, we in Michigan, have, we are one of uh, the largest states that, in terms of employer-based health insurance, we're proud of that. Uh, I like to say that it was Michigan and the uh, auto industry that created the middle class of this country with good paying jobs, good wages, good health care, good pensions, and we have, as a country, benefited tremendously by the envy of the world in terms of our middle class. Uh, now in a global economy, we find ourselves in a very challenging situation uh, because we are spending twice as much of our health care dollar, twice as much of our GDP on health care than any other industrialized country but we have 47 million people with no health insurance. There's something wrong with that picture. And unfortunately, because of the disparities between what our businesses pay and what is paid in other countries, we're losing jobs. We are literally losing jobs as a result of the structure of healthcare in this country and our inability to address costs, which can only be done by making sure that we are providing coverage for everyone. When folks say, well, I want to deal with access, I want to deal with cost, you can't get to cost unless you deal with the number of people who are walking into emergency rooms every day, sicker than they should be, or folks that should be going to see a primary care doctor instead of the emergency room. If we don't deal with that and the cost associated with that, and the fact that the hospital does the right thing, they treat people. And then they turn around and they raise every one of my employers' rates to pay for it. So we have universal health insurance. It is the most expensive, crazy structure in the world. And so we need to tackle that. And I very much appreciate the discussion today and the New America uh, efforts. Thank you, Lynn, again, for doing this because this is a fundamental debate for us. Uh, it's not only the right thing to do, I believe it's a moral issue in America, but we now know that it is an economic issue for us. And I want to take just a step back to 30,000 feet uh, for a moment and put it in just a little bit larger context. We're in a global economy. We uh, can and will compete and do business in a global economy. The question, I believe, in a global economy is whether or not we will compete down to the lowest common denominator or compete up. Will we compete and continue to have a middle class and strengthen it or not? That, I think, is truly the fundamental question for us in how we move forward in a global economy. And I've seen firsthand what happens when we only make it about competing down. And what I mean by that is, Competing down is really saying to you, just saying to everyone in America, if you only work for less, we can be competitive. If you only stop having health care or pay more in your costs, we can be competitive. If you only lose that pension, we can be competitive. That is a race to the bottom. 
because there will always be somebody in another country who can work for less. And we don't want to be down there. We want to bring them up. We want them to be strong and have a middle class so they can be our customers. I want to be exporting products, not jobs. So healthcare is a critical piece of that. And in the macro sense, I would just say this. When we talk about competing up, I believe the vision of competing up and, try and, and bringing the rest of the world with us is a level playing field on trade, so everybody is operating the same rules and they're enforced. Changing the way we fund healthcare so it's not on the back of employers. It's a partnership, government, private sector, individuals. And racing like crazy on education and innovation. That's what got America to where we are, and that's what we ought to be doing if we're going to make this a race to the top. Let me give you one example where I saw firsthand uh, what, what happens when we make it a race to the bottom. There's a little town in western Michigan named Greenville. I don't know if any of you have heard this story. Electrolux makes refrigerators, uh, made refrigerators, in Greenville, Michigan. A couple of years ago, they indicated that they felt because of their competitors moving to Mexico, they needed to do the same. This is a little community that, that <coughs> had 2,700 people working at this plant. This was the employer of the community. And so everyone came in to see what we could do to help, to be able to help them stay in Greenville, Michigan. The city came in and said, okay, no property taxes. The, the county came in, no taxes. The state came in and said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll help you build a plant and there'll be no taxes. We'll, we'll pay for retraining if you need it. We came in, those of us at the federal level, and said, what can we do to help? We'll, we'll try to help. If it's a matter of building a new plant, it's a matter of, of what can we do? And they literally told us that if we eliminated, which we practically did, suggest eliminating all taxes, um, all, all of those kinds of costs, we couldn't compete with $1.50 an hour no health benefits, no pension. So it didn't matter. It didn't matter what we did. We could not compete with that. So, now, the discussion on healthcare doesn't do all of that, but I think it's a very big chunk of it. One other story. Living in the great state of Michigan, we look across the river at the great country of Canada. I'd rather be on our side than their side, but we look across at Canada. We see plants, auto plants, being built across the river, and the wages are the same. There's Canadian UAW. The environmental standards are the same, or stronger. The only difference, the only difference is healthcare. We're losing jobs, whether it's a race to the bottom, coupling healthcare and wages, or whether it's just simply looking at healthcare differences. We are losing jobs and, and creating, uh, and have, not, not just creating, we have a competitive disadvantage. And it's true, when General Motors is adding $1,500 for a vehicle, we look uh, uh, at anywhere from $95 on a vehicle with Toyota to others that are two or 300 We have a competitive disadvantage. So we've got to tackle this. And we need everybody. We need everybody tackling this. I'm very pleased to be joining with uh, a bipartisan effort, the one, the truly bipartisan effort in the Senate to begin to really tackle these issues in a way that involves the private sector, uh, private sector delivery with a universal health approach, uh, and it involves individuals. This is a, something called the Healthy Americans Act, which uh, Ron Wyden, Morgan has been our champion on. He has joined with Bob Bennett, Republican and Democrat. We now have uh, seven Democrats and seven Republicans. Uh, we are doing what I call the Noah's Ark approach, two by two. Uh, we, we are not adding a Democrat without adding a Republican uh, and, and vice versa. And we are, um, we have put in place now uh, a group of people who say the words out loud, universal health care. 
and have come up with an approach. It still needs work. And there are pieces of it that, that I believe need to be changed. We kind of all come with, yes, we want to do this, but I want to add something. And so I'm one of those that you know, we've, got, we've got work to do. But the idea of it is to provide uh, at least a minimum of what we receive as members of Congress, the federal employee health system, uh, at least that for every American, uh, and to do it uh, in a way that has private sector delivering health insurance like we do for federal employees, but creating a structure where they are uh, held accountable and regulated so that they have to take all comers. Uh, if you have a pre-existing condition, you have to be able to get health insurance so that there would be a, a constant system in terms of standards and accountability. We would uh, provide full insurance for those who are uh, at 100 percent of poverty or less, help to subsidize up to 400 percent of poverty, focus on wellness and prevention, and fundamentally this plan takes us from an employer-based system and takes all the dollars we're currently spending in the system and changes that to a system based on uh, every individual or family being given through the tax system, the ability to purchase group insurance, to be able to purchase through a, a group insurance plan. Last week, we found that, that through the Congressional Budget Office and Joint Tax Office, that our plan actually scores revenue neutral, <coughs> which is extraordinary. It says what I've been saying for a long time, we've got more than, we've got enough money in the system, we're just spending it wrong. The incentives are in the wrong place. And so this, shows that you can take the current dollars and move it in a direction. The employee would still make a contribution. The public sector would make a contribution. The individual would be involved, but we can do a much better job. Uh, we are hoping that with our uh, new president, uh, whoever this is, and, and uh, I have my choice, but whoever this is in the new year, uh, will um, be eager, and I believe they will, to work with uh, a ready-made group a bipartisan group in the United States Senate, from liberal to conservative, who've come together and said, you know what, this isn't working. We're spending way too much for the results we're getting, we're losing jobs, and fundamentally, this is about who we are as Americans. And we can do better uh, in the greatest country in the world. So thank you for uh, having me participate. I'm running off to catch a, a plane this morning, but I did want to make sure that I was here uh, to urge you on. And we can't do this without employers. We can't do this without employees. We can't do it without everybody deciding that, we, uh, that we're going to come together and fix something that has been broken for way too long. Thank you.
That is true. My profession has a somewhat, uh, shall we say, sanguine view of this matter. You go back to you know, what we worry. Fundamentally, you talk to an economist. In fact, you wake any economist up on an airplane and ask them, does this matter? They go, oh, no, 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 it comes out of wages, don't worry, you can't really check the competitiveness. Employers are just making it all up. You know, I have two things to say to that. One is, I'm kind of reluctant to look in the face of CEOs who make between 20 and 1,000 times what I make and tell them they're stupid. There's something wrong with that kind of dynamic. And second, when I think about the reality that, you know what, the best definition of an economist is someone who sees something happening perfectly clearly in real life and then rushes breathlessly back into the office to work out the math to see if it's possible. You know? And that's our real problem. We sort of think, well, it can't be true because it must come out of this stuff so long. And here's a graph that actually confirms if you think from 1960 to 19, 2005. But this is a share of GDP, some would say claimed by labor. It's a combination of wages, health insurance benefits paid by employers, and everything else that's uh, somehow uh, paid by employers, at least nominally. And if you add it all up from 1960 to 2006, the reduction in share going to wages is exactly the amount that's goes toward health benefits and other benefits. So economists are confirmed, see, this proves the picture. This proves that it comes out of wages. Therefore, it cannot affect prices. It cannot affect firms. It's all just a, just a shell game. To which I say, you know, economists are wonderful creatures, and they do have these great models, which we all learned, of long equilibrium. But 46 years is kind of a long time to work for equilibrium. So what I will say is if you do it just by decade, is a decade long enough? Look at the decade. And what you see here, look there. This is share GDP change of the different categories you just saw by decade. And what you will find is that there is no decade in which the change in wages exactly counterbalances the change in health insurance or the sum of these two. So that in the 60s, both went up. Remember, in the 60s, labor's actually gaining, contrary to what some people think is possible. In the 70s, wages go down by way more than health insurance goes up. In the 80s, similarly. In the 90s, again, they both go up. And then in the 2000s, of course, wages are really from them. So what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that long-run theory is a great thing. Firms live in the short run. And there are lots of ways to think about it. And there are sort of union contracts that are multi-year, and sometimes there are minimum wage constraints, but not too many minimum wage firms are actually all. That's not relevant. What's really relevant is this. Firms would prefer to push health care cost growth backward into wages. They certainly try. I think Jerry can attest to that. But unions push back, and workers push back everywhere. And unions that exist in some sectors give strength and courage to unions that workers are not unionized in others. And they push back. And fundamentally, it's really hard to push continually higher and higher health care cost growth into wages in the short run. That's my fundamental point. I'm talking about the short run. I'm talking about where CEOs actually live. You might have heard this rumor. They are hired and fired based on quarterly profits. So the notion they wait for 10 years or 46 years is just a little bit not true. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is the problem. If you look at American health care costs per hour in manufacturing, $2.38, and our trade weight average, $0.96. Cents. And that is the fundamental deal. Now, what these are are countries that I picked mostly because these are the numbers that there are trading partners by ranks, what counts number one, what counts number four, et cetera. I picked these because these are what I would call high value added countries. Those are the countries with companies that are making the kinds of products that we want to make. We want to compete with them in that high value added sector. We do not want to go, as Senator Stavenow said to the Bob, we do not, we cannot compete with India and China for low value added things. But we should be able to compete for high value added jobs and high value added products. And that is exactly the kind of jobs that protects the middle class, that nurtures the middle class. And my fear is that our focus on our sanguinity about the long run. We've forgotten in the short run, firms are actually bearing quite a bit of this burden. And in doing so, they're becoming increasingly unable to uh, sell their goods and so forth. Now, what are the big, why is this true? Two reasons, it seems to me, fairly obvious. One is, our employers do bear a larger share of our total health care 
structure than most companies. And second, we have a very inefficient healthcare system. I know you've heard that rumor too. We spend twice as much as the OECD average. We serious people from Alan Garber at Stanford, the Brent James at Amount Healthcare, to the Dartmouth Group led by Jack Lindbergh and Elliot Fisher, serious people with different methodologies conclude about a third of what we spend on healthcare is not adding clinical value. If you think about it, 16% of GDP on healthcare, a third not adding clinical value, you're talking about 5% of GDP we are essentially wasting. All right? So we're paying for that, and our employers are paying a chunk of it. And that's part of the deal. Now, this is per capita. You know these numbers. I'm not going to belabor the point. It just shows you per person we're spending a heck of a lot more and our employers are paying a bigger share. Now, here's what I'm really worried about. It speaks to Senator Stabenow's introduction. You know, uh, this is the fraction of our jobs that are in services. This is the fraction of our jobs that are in manufacturing. And I want to point out information. I'm going to show you uh, some seconds here in a moment. Information is the light blue. You can see that we basically it's about two percent of jobs. Okay. And what I'm trying to say is that we have lost. Sorry, we have lost these manufacturing jobs over time, and we've gained service jobs. Now, what this is is what I call the the sort of matrix we ought to pay attention to. This is value added per worker. This is, in some sense, the potential of jobs to support high wages. And you see manufacturing is at 110, and all services are 105. And by the way, this services includes a lot of high wage services, right? You know, all the people who do what Joe Antos does for a living, he's really smart service people. They do. Wait a minute, I'm supposed to get paid more? <laughs> yes, that's right. Go back and tell them, Joe. Okay. But anyway, my point is retail, okay? That's what's growing. And that's our, that's our fundamental, that's our fundamental problem. Okay. So I would submit just very briefly. Reducing reliance on the employer financing role. Eliminate it if you want, but at minimum, what I think hard about reducing it. Reducing it is good health policy and it's good economic policy. It's going to enable us to create more middle class jobs. But we should never just abandon people to the individual market on their own. Unambiguously, you would want to do this only in a framework in which you maintain, indeed, perhaps enhance the advantages of group purchasing for every American. And that's precisely, by the way, what the bill Senator Stabenow has described does, among a number of other approaches. But I would just say what you want to do is make a marketplace that works for all. You want to make sure everyone can buy in that marketplace, both by having rules that say you can't discriminate based on health status and by having subsidies for low income. And in my view, to make the market work really well, you're going to have to have a requirement to purchase so that you make the risk pool and need the population. You're going to have to have an individual mandate to make that market work. Okay, let me stop there and turn to my presentation. Thanks, Len. Um, thanks, Senator Stabenow. Thanks, Senator Stabenow. Thanks, Senator Sometimes more than you get understanding. So, you know, what, 
what's the real insight? It's more, much more complicated and also much less interesting than most people seem to think. Uh, <coughs> the, the full story, at least uh, my version of the full story, is in equilibrium, I'm going to say certain words that I will attempt to explain later, in equilibrium, uh, the, comp the composition of compensation adjusts so the workers on average receive their preferred levels of wages and benefits. Okay, that's the first point. The second point, total compensation does not increase simply because some of the compensation is in non-wage benefits. In other words, you're worth what you're worth as a worker. And third, if the cost of a benefit, in this case healthcare, increases, then assuming that nothing else changes other than wages, wages must adjust downward. Now, when you think about it, that's pretty damn uninteresting, isn't it? What it says is, if you have one thing changed in the system, and you want to go back to equilibrium, and you only allow change in one other thing, it changes. There's an economic insight. Um, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the key points here? Uh, you know, first of all, long-run equilibrium. Second of all, uh, nothing else uh, changes. Of course, the labor market never really quite reaches long-run equilibrium. Uh, I don't think we'd know it if we saw it. If it did happen, it would be over so quickly that, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, and furthermore, there are many other market factors that are likely to adjust in response to rising employee health benefit costs. Uh, Senator Stabenow mentioned something. Uh, you could have layoffs, you could have reduced hiring, reduced health benefits, reduced non-health benefits, changes in the production process to improve efficiency, more targeted market, Changes in product design. Higher product prices, lower investor returns. There are probably others that they didn't think of. The point is that you can't draw simple lines looking at the trends of wages and benefits and draw any conclusion whatsoever. There's too much going on. You can't tell anything by a that's a graph. So the bottom line is that uh, you know, in the real world that we live in, which is not an equilibrium ever, uh, you expect workers to absorb some of the costs that, that we see in, in healthcare through lower wage growth, fewer benefits, less employment, but employers also pick up some of the costs through, the, through uh, the other things that I mentioned. In the long run, however, if we can ever get there, uh, if, if, if workers are not willing to pay fully for their benefits, then employers are forcing them to accept more health benefits than they want, and that doesn't make any sense. Because you, the employer could save money by offering more wages and less, uh, less health care and have the compensation package shrink. And that would make the workers uh, happier than where they are now. But of course, that's a long <laughs> equilibrium statement. And it has very little bearing, if anything, on policy. There's no policy guidance in this at all. OK, now what about international competitiveness? Well, you know, employers seem to think this matters. And, and uh, so why is that? Well, partly it's because employers write a check for, for their share, their considerable share of, of the cost. And it's a, it's a big check. Furthermore, employers feel that they have less control over health costs than their other costs of production, which may or may not really be true, but that's what they think. And of course, for most, it's not their main line of business. Uh, moreover, uh, they, they, they can't act unilaterally. There may be unions, but there are certainly workers to consider. But there are also competitors in the labor market. You don't want to be the first uh, employer on your industrial block to uh, cut back benefits if nobody else is going to go with you. So uh, they're kind of trapped. So you can understand this, this feeling. OK, now, <clears throat> this feeling is important. But what does it say about competitiveness? Well, the fact is that competitiveness is not simply a matter of the relative cost of producing products. There's also the demand side. If you don't have a product that people want to buy, you're not competitive. That's obvious. And unfortunately, the auto industry, the American auto industry in the 80s demonstrated its lack of competitiveness. It wasn't because they were paying enormous compensation packages. That was, that was undoubtedly true. It still is true. Uh, they didn't have cars that people wanted to buy compared to Japanese cars that came in uh, with you know, things that actually fit together. All the screws were tightened. So you know, we've learned a lot since then. That's great. American cars are, are great cars now. But the fact is, if you don't have the product, you can't be competitive. Again, it's a much more complicated situation than just looking at one benefit and saying that's the problem. 
So what's really going on here? Well, I think it's the hope that somebody somewhere will pick up the cost of, uh, of, of the benefit. Um, should we subsidize employers who are victims of high health care costs? And what does that mean, being victimized? Uh, anyway, well, if paying for health care costs would help competitors, paying for wages would help even more. Because wages are much bigger than health benefits. So why do you pay for everything? Obviously, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it's ridiculous to think that simply having the taxpayers pick up uh, the cost of health benefits is going to do anything other than rearrange the grand chairs on the Titanic. And that's a point that, of course, Glenn made. We've got to do some things on the health system uh, if we're going to make any progress here. But the fact is that uh, the uh, firms that have the highest health care costs uh, are not necessarily the victims. They are also uh, the, the victims of forces outside their control. They're also victims of uh, poor management over probably decades and, and, and bad decisions. Uh, uh, you can't parse this out. You can't tell. All you know for sure is that those who are in the worst trouble will get the biggest benefit, and you have to ask yourself whether they should be rewarded or not. Uh, I think that's a fair um, so this is really just an exercise in finding some or someone else to pay for health benefits. This is tossing the hot potato around when what we ought to be doing is cooling the hot potato. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Len has ideas about that, but that's not the subject of this paper. Um, uh, sort of in conclusion, uh, Len uh, supports uh, some real changes in the in health insurance system. He supports moving to a more individual-based insurance system. I think that's, that's a great start. And, and even more importantly, uh, he's thinking about something that we all ought to think about, which is how do we get from here to there? Uh, presidential campaigns are specialized in telling you about there. Uh, but here to there, that's the hard part. Uh, now, uh, however, however, um, we, uh, he, he supports this idea of uh, forcing a cash out uh, that is in the uh, wide, you know, uh, wide money having employers uh, bump up uh, wages for a couple of years for employees uh, when they uh, get out of the health insurance business. Uh, and that says he's against, in general, he's against employer mandates, but isn't that a mandate? Of course it is. It's just another kind of mandate. And how do we know that that level of wages is the right level of wages? After all, we're not in equilibrium. That's Len's point, so we don't really know. And furthermore, how do we know if it's going to be true next year? We don't know. We don't know. And so, is it reasonable to think that the government can really dictate that pinpoint as a solution in terms of compensation? Uh, it seems unlikely to me. Um, he also rejects employer mandates as unworkable. Uh, again, I think I think the this idea of uh, having the government set the level of wages for a couple of years is, is, is pretty much a mandate. But my last point, I think, is the key point, which is that we all ought to think of politicians, especially about the thing before they pledge us to reform, health reform, that we are a common Thank you very much. Uh, Charles Cole is next. He's the president of the Committee for Economic Development, which is a nonpartisan organization of over 200 businesses and education leaders who are dedicated to economic and policy, uh, social policy research. Before joining CED, he uh, was general counsel of the United States of America, and he also served as deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy and the office of management and budget and the Department of Education. Thank you very much, Lori. I'm a recovering attorney, so I cannot do jokes. Jokes, uh, or trying not to. Uh, one, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be here uh, to talk this morning about, uh, about your excellent paper and the August and thoughts on your report. Um, I really pre appreciate this thoughtful and, um, and detailed analysis, which I think goes directly to the, um, the issue of the employer role and uh, the finance of the, the um, American healthcare system has to change. And uh, this is so uh, thank you. First, a little bit about uh, about CED, the Committee for Economic Development. We're a uh, business-led think tank. We're nonpartisan, bipartisan. We have Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and others uh, on the board. We have more than 200 trustees, most of whom are senior business leaders, and uh, a couple dozen major university presidents. 
We were founded in, in 1942, and our mission for 66 years has, to, has been to bring a voice of business community to bear on important public policy issues that we think affect uh, economic growth and development, both in this country and um, abroad. One of our early projects, most of you uh, have heard of, we uh, helped do the, what became the design plan for the, uh, for the Marshall Plan. Um, so we're here today uh, working on, on health care reform, and I'm pleased to say, as Len knows, that we are a founding member of a very important coalition, the Better Health Care Together Coalition, which includes Walmart, the Service Employees International Union, uh, the Communications Workers in America, Intel, AT&T, Kelly Services, and Manpower, Howard, Howard Baker Center, the Center for American Progress. It's a business labor policy coalition which is committed to achieving universal health care coverage for all Americans, not later than 2012. 65 years ago, 66 years ago, when CDE was founded, we helped lead the way for American economic growth in, in the post-war economy, and now, I think it's fair to say we find ourselves at perhaps a comparable turning point. As our coalition recognizes, and as Len points out in this paper, and why we are all here on Friday morning in Washington, the healthcare system that we have now is simply not working, it is not sustainable. CPD uh, first looked at this issue uh, six years ago, and we reached a different conclusion. We thought that the system was sustainable, was fixable. We recommended a number of, of things that the government could do, that the private sector could do, that individuals can do. Nothing happened. Actually, some things did, did happen. The system uh, got worse. Uh, the uh, costs uh, uh, continued to escalate faster than GDP, and the number of uninsured uh, rose. And the uh, impact on business is, is even worse. Uh, we now see situations where families are actually facing bankruptcy with catastrophic or near catastrophic health care expenses. Now, as you heard from Len, we face serious challenges in terms of our international competitiveness. Just to give you one figure, according to the January 2007 analysis of the McKinsey Global Institute on the costs of health care, the U.S. is outspending and underperforming our peer countries. We're spending $500 billion more than other countries, and that figure could be climbing to $700 billion. We're also, by the way, not getting comparable results. If you're outspending the rest of the world on the aggregate and um, on per, per capita basis, and yet we're not living as long as countries that spend less, it ought to tell you something about how we're investing uh, those dollars. Um, over. Sorry about that. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so to compete in the international economy, we require, absolutely have to have now, a healthy, educated workforce in the flexible economy. So I'm here today to talk with you about the state of health insurance in the new economy and what can be done to maximize the impact and the coverage of our health care spending. Now, we've identified the problems and issued a set of findings and recommendations in a new report those of you who like the long reports, uh, this is a 100 page version of it. It's called Quality Affordable Health Care for All, moving beyond the employer based health insurance system. For those of you who are time challenged, like everyone else, we have it for two pages. Findings <laughs> <laughs> on one page and uh, recommendations on the back. And, and Joe, we, uh, we do actually, in this report, take on the issue of how do you get from here to there. Um, but if you take away only two things from, from what I say this morning, let, let, let these be the two points. First of all, the debate on health care in this country starts generally from an ideological premise, from one of two perspectives. On the right, people say we have to have everything driven by the markets. And on the left, we have to have universal coverage, uh, typically fold everything into a Medicare for all system. Both starting points, in my view, are wrong. And as the late Jerry Grossman, who was our co-chair for the CED report, likes to say, the CED report is neither Medicare for all or markets for all. And we explain some like why that's the case. But the second point, to go beyond the ideological non-starters, is that this system is failing to meet the needs of the current workforce. It's not a question of ideology, it's a question of pragmatism in designing or redesigning a healthcare system 
that actually works for Americans. The employer-sponsored system, as we know it, is not sustainable for a number of reasons. Employer-based health insurance is costly to market and to administer, roughly 20% of the total, plus employer employer cost. It's far more than it would cost if there were competitive regional exchanges with equalized risk. But employer benefits, the employer benefit system leaves out too many people and it leaves many others insecure. The employer-sponsored system depresses real wages. The employer-sponsored system interferes with the efficiency of the job market. This is the so-called, you economists call it, um, job law. It blocks people from going out and starting their own businesses. The employer-sponsored system interferes with the continuity of care and records as people change jobs and are forced to leave the delivery system of their choice. And this gives health, health plans basically short-term incentives. In short, the whole system, the way it has been structured and how it's evolved since World War II, when it, uh, uh, we stumble into it, is frankly an anachronism in a world where median job tenure is short. So the question, when you have basically a dysfunctional system, is how do you, how do you move beyond it? Now, we have, I'll try and give you the thumbnail sketch of what, of what CED recommends. Um, we also talk about the, the figure of how you think of First of all, uh, I look at the system as sort of a combination of the um, a little bit of DRGs, the diagnosis related groups, a little uh, federal employees, uh, health plan, and, uh, and the Federal Reserve. Uh, so first, we would establish an independent body or a health fed that would oversee regional health insurance exchanges. The health fed would modernize and simplify health insurance regulation and it would ensure competitive standards in the regional health insurance markets. This would improve on, build on, and improve on the, uh, the current federal employees health benefits plan. So every plan uh, under this uh, approach would be required to meet the comprehensive standards set by the exchange and only quality plans with broad coverage would be allowed to compete. Second, we would uh, grant fixed dollar credits to every American to purchase health insurance, needless to say we get rid of the current, uh, current tax treatment. And then finally, we would create a National Institute for Medical Outcomes and Technology Assessment. And this would be a body that would help provide uh, authoritative scientific information about the value and costs of clinical Interventions. One other point, we have another report which I didn't bring with us, but, uh, but it's on our website. It's a companion report to the, uh, the overall uh, uh, report on reform. And that's a report that focuses on the role that uh, the IT revolution and the whole movement towards openness can play in helping to drive down um, the health care costs and also to, uh, to increase efficiency. The healthcare system is outmoded uh, for another reason, somebody does to take uh, advantage, full advantage of the technology that's evolved over the last 20 or 25 years. You've been to a doctor's office recently and you have to fill out the same form five times and tell them your social security number and your birthday. That paper goes somewhere, all right? And the people who file out it, you, you, you can follow along the, um, the costs that are associated with just that one failure to take administrative, to take uh, advantage of the technology, not to mention the wonderful handwriting that most physicians have. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to writing uh, prescriptions. So the CED proposal will allow health consumers to make cost-conscious decisions for purchasing health insurance. So under our approach, each healthcare consumer will receive fixed dollar amounts to purchase health insurance from the regional health exchanges. What we propose is very similar coincidentally, it's actually not intentional, it's actually a wonderful coincidence, very similar to what was involved the emerging here in the Congress as the Wyden Bennett Healthy Americans Act, which has been introduced in the, uh, in the Senate. So we're very uh, grateful for the uh, bipartisan interest that seems to be emerging, and I hope that uh, one of the things that you can do this morning is to help further uh, that, uh, that momentum. But having said that, um, at CED, we have absolutely no illusions that either our work or our joint efforts, for that matter, will be easy. We're talking about performing 16% of the gross domestic product. So when you look at all the interests and parties and dollars that are involved, the change here, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be extremely difficult. But we simply cannot afford to waste another decade. 
either for the individuals who are affected by the system or for our economy. The world of work has changed dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years. Our healthcare system hasn't. And so we have to come at it from a structured, market-based, uh, incentive-oriented approach which will guarantee universal coverage to all Americans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we turn to Andrew Weber, who is the president and uh, CEO of the National Business Coalition on Health. Previously, he worked with the Consumer Coalition for Quality Healthcare, the American Medical Peer Review Association, and the Washington Business Group on Health. Uh, thank you, Lori. It's uh, great to be here. I appreciate Glenn very much the uh, invitation, and I want to thank you all for coming out on a sort of rainy, gloomy uh, Friday. Um, and and uh, you know, it's it's great to have some debate. So I, I hope to sort of share a different point of view uh, up here, and perhaps be less gloomy than we've heard so far. Uh, and if there is one takeaway remark that I'd like to leave you with, I think there are tremendous opportunities in health and healthcare to improve quality, to control better costs. And I want to keep the employer actually as a lever point for that in our current system. Uh, for those that don't know who we are, we're the National Business Coalition on Health. We're a national association of 60 purchaser-based coalitions around the country. We've been in existence for over a decade. Coalitions have been around uh, for over three decades. We represent a national network of 6,000 employers that are members of local coalitions. And we've come together around a vision of improving health and transforming the healthcare delivery system through a strategy of value-based purchasing. Um, so I, I've been asked to comment on, on Len's paper, and let me do that. And my summary statement, Len, is that I agree very much with your diagnosis, but I'm not sure I agree with your treatment plan. Um, regarding Len's major point of the paper, U.S. business bears a greater burden of financing healthcare than employers in our major trading partner countries. I'm in complete agreement. And to be honest, I didn't know there was a debate about that. <laughs> uh, and perhaps it is within the world of economists where this debate goes on. But in the real world where certainly I operate, working in local communities to deal with rising health care costs, there's no debate at all. Um, and, and I'm also in agreement with Len's major point that employers can swiftly or easily in a competitive labor market reduce wages or simply shift all health care costs on the workers uh, to make up for this rising health insurance burden that, as we all know, runs currently three times wage and inflation trend rate. Um, I'm also in agreement, as Len says in this paper, that the business community can't simply raise product prices in response to these rising operating costs because of, of global competition. So, you know, in talking to our members around the country, coalitions and employers, um, you know, there's no debate about Len's conclusion that we're at a competitive disadvantage because of rising health care costs. It is certainly the prevailing view that I hear wherever I go. So the big question in my mind is not debating that issue. The big question is what the hell are we going to do about it? Uh, which Len does get to at the end of his paper. Uh, to use uh, my analogy, what is the treatment plan? And here, let me just tell you, I'm not ready. Sort of different from other employer representatives. Another thing that you should all know, that the business community is not monolithic in our views. Uh, you've heard one business perspective. You've heard one business perspective. Uh, it is a variable community. But we're at, at the NBCH, National Business Coalition on Health, working again with employers around the country, not ready to throw in the towel on employer finance health care as the principal foundation and pillar of our current system. And, and yes, we recognize the cracks in the system, particularly for the small employer market. And I, we do believe and support 
that things need to happen in that domain along the lines that Len and, and others have talked about in terms of the ability of small employers to buy in to a group purchasing arrangement that might very well be organized by the government. We've seen that in Massachusetts and we've seen the proposals here. But at the same time, uh, you know, let's, let's recognize, that again, I'm trying to keep the optimist up here, uh, you know, some of, some of the strengths of the current system. Provides health insurance coverage to 71% of Americans working in the private sector. Not everyone, but 71%. For over half a century, the spread risk and pool covered lies from group insurance, creating far greater leverage in a marketplace than individual consumers could ever generate on their own. It's established, very important to us, the employer community as purchasers, more importantly as change agents for improving health and health care and creating a much needed demand side leverage point um, as a balance to the supply driven system that controls so much of the action out there right now. The employer-based system has been the innovator and leader of value-based purchasing, introducing innovations like pay-for-performance, value-based benefit design, managed care, HEDIS, health plan, and provider report cards. We would not have those advances without the employer community demanding them historically. Employers have been a leader in health promotion, prevention, chronic care management at the work site and in communities. Because goal number one for employers is to improve the health and productivity of their workforce. That is a competitive asset for them. Uh, so they have real stake in the game. And through the work of business and health coalitions uh, uh, that has established repurchasing arrangements among employers, uh, we have been able, again, to provide high quality care at lower cost and created also through coalitions, a collective voice of the employer community for healthcare reform. Coalitions are established because no single employer can have leverage on the largest sector of the American economy. So the idea of coalitions is that we come together in local markets where healthcare happens. And, and to sort of conclude, my final point is that I also have to take exception to Len's comment towards the end of his paper that employers are powerless to control future health care cost increases. The word was powerless. Indeed, I would argue, and again, to my basic thesis here, just the opposite. If the employer community got really serious as purchasers, and I agree, we've been far too timid and passive up to now, but if we got aggressive and serious in combination with large public programs, Medicare and, and Medicaid, and aggressively instituted a value-based purchasing strategy that included the pillars of common performance measurement, full transparency, payment reform, because we have such a misaligned set of economic incentives in the system. We pay more for poor quality in the healthcare system and have no incentives for better performance. What other industry would allow that to go on? And yet, we as purchasers have to bear responsibility for letting those economic incentives uh, grow up over time. And employers, I believe, do need to be an instigator of consumer activation and choice as well. And we can play a role in that. Uh, and provide the support mechanisms and the right incentives so consumers do take greater ownership and responsibility for their own care and drive uh, improvements in health status. And, and I say all this because there's evidence of it. You know, <laughs> I've been, I also worked at the National Committee for Quality Assurance uh, and uh, one of the it's sort of states persons in all of healthcare, Peggy O'Kane. Peggy, Peggy always used to call me the Boy Scout boy at uh, NCQA. Uh, and I am something of a Boy Scout, but I think we've got evidence that we can drive higher quality and better control costs. As Lance <laughs> said, you know, in terms of his two major drivers, we know there's tremendous waste and efficiency, uneven quality, practice variation, 
And again, as I just mentioned, extraordinarily misaligned economic incentives that we as purchasers must change. And I don't have faith that the consumers out there can change that. We know if we organize care and practice the same kind of medicine as we find in some communities in the country, like Minnesota, we could save a third of all healthcare expenditures and get higher quality in the bargain in terms of how healthcare through integrated systems need to be organized. We know, as Glenn said in his paper with his chart, we know from the experience of 1990s that healthcare costs can be controlled. They were controlled by employers demanding innovation that we abandoned because of politics more than anything else, I would argue, in the 1990s. And we're talking about the age of managed care. Managed care done right, completely misbranded in terms of what we call it, in terms of the acceptance of the American population. But let's, let's be clear, that was a political battle. Uh, with the provider community saying we will not stand for control of the health care delivery system. <coughs> it had an impact then on health care costs. In fact, we had some years where health care trend was lower than, than inflation and lower than wages. And more than anything else, we as business leaders, I think, from our own experience in our own industries, understand that product redesign, process re-engineering, advanced information technology, and improved worker productivity can vastly improve quality right while reducing operating costs. A quality management revolution has happened in a lot of other industries. Why not in healthcare is the question. So again, to conclude, Glenn, I'm not ready to have employers throw in the towel and head for the hills, as, as yes, many, many are doing, many are thinking of doing, and give this over to consumers to solve on their own. I want employers to remain a change agent, and as a purchaser, demand the transformation of the healthcare delivery system in our country. That again, I, I am convinced can improve quality, improve health outcomes, while controlling the health care costs that Len correctly has argued and stated, puts American business at a competitive disadvantage. Thank you.
One of the solutions to that, I think the most important issue long term that's currently getting a lot of attention is what a number of people have alluded to and Andy spoke to at length, which is uh, the attempt to transform healthcare in America to make it a high value patient-centered system. And since the Institute of Medicine reports uh, 10 years ago, there has been a tremendous amount of energy put into this, uh, into this effort. And you see that there are numerous examples of it today. I'm sure that you're familiar with at least some of those. Unless we are successful at changing the health system in a substantial way, this is a unsustainable situation long term. And to discuss this in terms of who financing, who's going to pay the bill, is a lose-lose discussion. And one of our goals uh, for the rest of the, uh, for the, this election year and for um, next year is to try to turn this into a debate about what set of changes do we need to uh, get this thing in a balanced situation. And in that respect, um, I think Andy's points about the importance of employer involvement uh, are really uh, uh, significant here. Because in this in, uh, effort to improve quality, employers have played a leading edge role along with consumer organizations um, in, in terms of pushing this forward. They have said, we want to provide health benefits. Our workers want health benefits, but we can't continue to do it this way. And as one employer representative put it uh, one day in a meeting, a phrase that really struck me, we buy health care like we buy nothing else. We pay the same amount for great world-class care, for average care, for poor care, or for downright dangerous care. And we don't know the difference today. That is true. It is a simple fact of the matter. And unless we come to terms with that, all the debates and discussions about how are you going to finance this thing uh, really are fruitless. I want to finish with uh, just a couple of points on the employer system. And I guess I should confess I rise in defense uh, of employer involvement in health care. This has been, for all of its problems, a remarkably durable system. You've heard the numbers from both Len and from Andy in terms of coverage. Um, and it is, those are the case because this system has worked to a great extent. It has worked in terms of the way that Andy said, there is natural pools that get created at workplaces. Uh, there's not underwriting that goes on. It provides resources for workers uh, and so forth. Now, having said that, there's no, also no question that this system is, is an extreme danger. And without substantial policy reforms that uh, under, uh, uh, underpin that system, um, this, this can continue. And what we'll see is not the wholesale uh, ditching of this, but the continued erosion of, health, of decent health coverage simply by employers shifting uh, costs onto workers. Now that happens in all workplace situations. In the union situation, which is our experience, it is fascinating and disturbing to watch uh, because uh, workers uh, are accepting much lower wages or wage increases, certainly compared to the productivity increases that are going on in many industries, uh, in, in, um, ex in exchange for maintaining their existing health benefits. And again, the issue is health costs. It is one thing to moderate wages. We can accept that sort of thing. You can even freeze wages for a while, even though you don't like it. You can, you, people can work that out in their family budgets. They can't do without health coverage, and people understand that. And so the resistance to giving up health coverage is very strong. Where workers have power to resist, and I could give you a chapter verse about that, I, certainly it is a question of cutting up wages. If you don't know it, you should also understand this is directly a question of trading off jobs. I know many situations in manufacturing where employers have come to the table and said, starting with proposals to, uh, to, to move health costs up to workers, and then said in the end, well, we'll leave these the same, but you know, you're going to get a modest wage offer in return. And in addition, we will move more plants overseas. I've seen that in bargaining. I've heard it from company representatives say, health costs, 
capital is mobile. We just move production wherever we want to. And that's the reality of the global economy uh, today. So uh, in real life experience, um, this is a, a, a devastating situation. And my last point is this. We think it is not workable in a number of dimensions to go to a system where individuals take responsibility driven by changes in the tax system and left uh, to buy insurance in the insurance market. I think there is no factual basis that supports the, the, uh, the belief that that would succeed. And uh, since there isn't, uh, people are, would be and are already extremely resistant to that idea. The notion that you're going to start by taxing health, the value of employer-provided health benefits, for instance, as some people are proposing, is just, you know, it, it's just a non-starter with people politically. And the notion that you're going to leave people more alone with the health insurance industry is completely anathema. Think about your experience and your family's experience of dealing with the health industry today. Getting a claim paid, debating with them how much they're going to pay because the physician you want to go to is in this system, in that system, in and out of the network, does this, does that. If you have good coverage, dealing with the health insurance industry is a very trying experience. The idea that for people who don't have good coverage and are out in the individual market, if they can get insurance, they're paying a fortune for it because the administrative load on top of the benefits is in the range of 25 to 30%. So I don't think these, the, those systems are going to go anyplace. And we think the only workable way to do this is to enhance um, the, the public insurance options and match that with a continued strong role for employment-based coverage. And there are a lot of ways you can mix and match this. This is not Medicare for all. This, I mean, you could do Medicare for all. We'd certainly support that. But that is not what it needs to be. But you need to have a much stronger public uh, base for insurance. And then you need to calibrate, is that, does everybody have that? Do employers get to choose? There are advantages of doing that way? Can they maintain their existing systems? There are lots of ways to sort of um, calibrate uh, that match. But one of the important reasons why we think that is the only workable way to go is the point that Andy made, and that is purchasing power. We will not control costs in this system unless we amass more purchasing power than we now have aggregated in any one place. Medicare does a much better job than either the largest employers or the coalitions of employers, uh, and they, they readily admit that. But even that is not enough. We have to put these things together in a group, unified purchasing way in order to deal with the cost problem. So, um, we think this will be an interesting debate uh, over the uh, over the next year, year and a half, and um, we hope that among the differences that were expressed uh, at the forefront, um, we are able this time to craft an approach that actually does address these problems uh, because we don't have much time. Left.
Well, there's no question it's not the only issue. But my fundamental point is that why do we want to let this continue to be an additional burden? I mean, Joe made the point, I think it's right. There's more to life than relative prices. But if our relative price structure is inflated because we're paying more in healthcare costs than our competitors, then that makes it incumbent upon us to have an even better quality, which is harder to do. And so that's my point. If you, if you, if you, why do we want to add the burden? I agree with Jerry completely, and I think everyone here. Financing changing alone is not going to really solve the problem. What I'm trying to do is buy relief on the competitive front and then set in motion a set of changes that would enable us to do exactly what Jerry was talking about. We don't buy smarter across the board, and I agree buying power is the key to that. We're not we're never going to get there. So I'm, I'm fundamentally saying it is a, I'm, I'm arguing with my profession that indeed, Firms do bear some of the burden. That's why you see so many businesses focused on a health reform conversation. I think it's more likely to be constructive this time than it was last time. Is that my hope as well? And I believe it will be. But second, I'm saying why not try to reduce this burden that we can indeed uh, reduce uh, in a way that would enable us to preserve our middle class jobs quicker. Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Coughlin. I'm in the my question is from Mr. Cole. Um, how does your plan differ from the Clinton Healthcare Plan and the United Sorry, Tom. I wasn't uh, involved in the, in the Clinton Plan, so I don't consider myself an expert on it by any means. But um, I think um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to preserve market-based incentive-oriented uh, approach to health care reform. I don't think, for example, the, uh, the Clinton plan had uh, that as a starting point. They had, they had regionals, they were going to have pivots, and there were going to be multiple private insurance companies competing for the business of uh, individual consumers. Um, the, the name you think is gone, but you're talking about regional Yes, health costs are a problem, but the system that we have now 
is behaving perfectly rationally given the incentives that exist. Uh, as one of, one of our trustees, uh, Rob Chess, who is the, the head of Nectar Therapeutics, said, if you are on the board of a business with a cost structure that is 60% higher than your competitors, producing average quality products and not serving 15% of your customers, you wouldn't tinker at the edges. You'd probably fire management, undertake a major restructuring, and fundamentally change your approach to running your company. Well, that, in essence, is what we are dealing with here. And we are getting exactly the results. I mean, if you, if you, Jerry said, if we could put everything into Medicare, we could. And we'd get instantaneous universal coverage, we would bankrupt the country. Why? Because Medicare preserves the fee-for-service model, which employers have been complicit in, because they have basically been part of the effort to shield consumers, consumers from understanding the costs and consequences of their own choices. That system of incentives is not going to work. That was exactly the Clinton argument. Glenn, you were there. Well, I'm, I'm sort of a Reagan and Bush, so maybe there is an opportunity. <laughs> Bush one, excuse me. Maybe there is an opportunity for a uh, bipartisan consensus. I, I, would, I would just say uh, in response that um, what, what Charlie's got here is a smarter plan than the Clinton plan. Because the two things that really hurt, I think, were mm -hmm. the global budget which said that spending will be absolutely capped, or more precisely, subsidies will stop if states don't get spending targets and states have no better spenders to do that. So that was kind of a whole kind of prayer. And I think the fact that there was so much forcing of individuals to go through this new system scared people and you couldn't articulate how it would look. And so I think people were dumped into And that's why the transition part of his paper is really important. So, so, so Charles, the question is, why don't we as employers, as purchasers, demand the changes in the economic incentives that we need both on the provider side and, I agree with you, on the individual consumer side. We need to do that in a smart way. That still is our challenge. Why do we let fee-for-service medicine continue? Why do we let payments for poor quality? Why don't we have any kind of pay-for-performance incentive? Why do we pay for acute care rather than upfront prevention, chronic care management, the real population-based uh, uh, um, sort of management of care that we need? Uh, again, I think the critical issue is why we have been so passive when we could transform those basic economic incentives. What's the answer? And, well, the, well, the answer is, the answer is again, as, as I tried to say, a demand for value-based purchasing. No, what's the answer? Why do employers be more so passive? I think, well, I think there are many reasons why employers are passive. I think they've left it to sort of uh, benefit uh, managers rather than CEOs um, getting involved. So I think CEOs and businesses focused on their own product and they're frustrated. I think the mechanics of a value-based purchasing and the pillars of performance measurement, of really demanding changes from uh, their agents in healthcare that they've relied on, continues to be sort of the culture. But again, you know, business changes all the time, and they understand how important economic incentives are. And I think, again, they could have, they could be much more of a lever point for making those changes. Could I, could I comment? You asked me to comment. I don't want to make a cheap shot and then uh, <laughs> the other cheap shot is is that employers can't even deal with their own compensation issue. Uh, they cannot, and this has been a serious problem for the last 10 years. The senator said that if only we would work for less, we can be competitive. You know, that's what the message is. I don't see CEO compensation <laughs> headed in the same direction. And that's a cheap shot, but I mean, it's a serious problem. And we want to have a vibrant business voice when it comes to public policy. That's one of the reasons why we've had a, a deadlock on a number of issues over the last six or seven years, because employers have basically, many of them have been in the gopher hole since, since Enron. We want to have a very strong, vibrant business voice here. But the answer to, to Andrew's question is a very good question, is employers aren't in that business. I mean, all of the things that he says are wonderful, Going back to the uh, joke about economists, in theory, and we recommended a number of them, but they aren't happening because employers today face much shorter time horizons. The pace of global competition is much greater, faster than it was 
10 years ago, and this isn't what they want to be in the business of doing. In theory, it works. Yeah, harness all the market power, you know, um, it's not working. Every point that Andrew makes is per a perfectly good point, but it is not, it hasn't happened, and I submit to you it will not happen. I don't see any indication of the trend line in terms of the number of employers offering coverage or the number of employees being covered going up. I don't see it. I'm normally an optimist about it. Um, Bob Rosenblatt, freelance writer. I'd like to ask Mr. Nichols, Mr. Antos, Mr. Cobb to put aside the <coughs> vocational training and fitness political observers who work in this town. <laughs> Just heard Jerry Shea that, say that the wine Bennett approach, shifting to individuals, is a non-starter. What makes you think that next year when there will be Democratic majorities in the House and Senate and 50-50 chance of a Democrat in the White House, what makes you think that something that the AFL-CIO says is a non-starter would have any chance of even being discussed seriously in rooms like this? Well, I would say that uh, Jerry and I could have a nice lunch and I could explain a little bit more about the other white <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of respect. But the bottom line is, let's take what Jerry's absolute conditions are. You want to make sure that individuals are not thrown <clears throat> adrift into a market where they're left alone to deal with uh, individual insurers. I couldn't agree more. I, I think the approach of putting people in the individual market all by themselves, unregulated, which is exactly what some people would do, is uh, it, it's frankly the quickest path to single payer I can think of. If you've got 50 million Americans understanding what actual early care really meant to them, we had to take care for all that night. But I think the bottom line is what smart reforms do, and I think you can look at them from both what are being proposed in some of the campaign uh, documents, uh, the CED, the Risk Industry Committee, the Federation of American Hospitals, our own plan with America. We're all looking at how you create the advantages of the, of the employer system and uh, extend those advantages to everyone. So economies of scale, Jerry talked about ridiculous loads, that is to say, administrative waste that we spend now underwriting and, and marketing, you can make all that go away by changing incentives. It's all about changing incentives. But you want to make that marketplace friendly to all, and you make it efficient. The FDHBP structure, as Charlie laid out, is kind of one of the elements of design in, 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 in the CED vision. That is about achieving economies of scale and risk pooling and making markets both more efficient and more fair. I submit to you, any, any bill that's going to pass a Congress uh, that's going to spend money, and you might have heard this from where health care will cost a dime or two, we can spend some of the money we're spending now, but it's going to require 60 votes in the Senate. Right. 60 votes in the Senate means there's got to be uh, bipartisan support, and I think therefore we'll have a conversation about how to achieve that. The market incentives will be there, as well as the government. Just to follow up on Bob's point, um, if you have your Democratic Uh, I have to be and will continue to be completely neutral directed, <laughs> but I will say this, that um, the uh, approach uh, outlined by Senators Obama and Clinton, I wouldn't describe it so much as shoring up the employer-based system. I would describe it as trying to make sure the market as is works for all, and you got to make a new market to do that. They acknowledge Andy's fundamental point. The small business market is broken. <coughs> And they say to them, look, we're going to make a new market. By the way, it's a lot like the FHPP structure that Charlie and I are talking about. We're going to make a new market that will work for them. Anyone who wants to come in who can. Anyone who wants to stay where they are can stay there. Now, the one difference in their approach and mine is that, and Charlie's, is that they would require firms that don't offer to pay a, a, a tax, to be blunt about it. Um, and I, in my perspective, it is, you know, we're already having trouble with competition. Uh, why do you want to put a tax on, in essence, low-wage workers? Because fundamentally, you're saying to those to the firms that don't offer, those are low-wage firms, and so it, it, you're going to cost yourself jobs if you do that. So I think that, by the way, will be something that might be discussed in Congress when it arrives. If McCain were to win, then, and I would agree with Bob, it's 50-50 at the moment. Uh, if McCain were to win, I think he'd get here, and his proposal for the individual market 
would be a non-starter. There's no question about that. And you might actually have a nation of China. <coughs> you never know depending on the uh, on the majority. Huh? Yeah. To Andrew, I guess mostly. Yeah. I guess I appreciate your comment that you know, the business community is on the left because there, there are plenty of employers out there who actually would love to throw in the towel and, and uh, not have to deal with this. I can totally understand from labor's perspective why you wouldn't want uh, to get rid of that employer health care base. And I think Lynn actually spoke to it quite well. It sort of depends on what you replace it with, and if you could have all the protections, maybe it doesn't really matter as so much. I guess from an employer perspective, I can't see why on earth you would actually want to keep this as if you didn't have to. And I wonder then if it also has to do with what you think might come in place of the existing system and if you can talk about that. Well, uh, again, uh, I think we can read readily acknowledge that there is a diverse viewpoint within the employer community. And as we've all talked about this morning, a huge degree of frustration with the current system. But I can just tell you, based on the employers that we work with, and based on a recognition that health and productivity, and by extension the healthcare system that impacts health and productivity of their workforce, is enough of an issue that they do believe, better than just handing this responsibility over to their consumers, that they have a responsibility to play. Uh, it's part of, of recruiting, a talented workforce, it's part of maintaining a talented workforce, and my major point is that uh, a lot of enlightened employers believe that their purchasing power, unlike a disaggregated purchasing power by individual consumers, can play a very useful, and some would even argue a transformational role, if they did it right. And I, I acknowledge fully that the employer community over its history, given its track record, has been far too timid. So, okay. so, so, so you know, I think um, uh, whether we're talking about sort of the majority view or an element of the employer community, I'm, I'm probably <coughs> biased. I'm dealing with employers and our coalitions work with employers um, that, that feel a responsibility to provide comprehensive health insurance and feel that in that responsibility they have a very important role to play uh, and they are thinking very creatively about how to use that lever of purchasing power and in combination with other employers in local communities. So, 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 I so and, and again look at all the history of innovation as, as Jerry acknowledged in terms of the last decade you know, whether it's, whether it's changing economic incentives, whether it's pushing health care plans, uh, whether it's managed care of the 1990s that did have an impact on health care costs. Uh, I disagree a little bit with Jerry. I mean, employers are not totally sanguine and confident that Medicare is going to be doing the right thing. But finally, Medicare is talking about value-based purchasing. Uh, and I do think that what we do in the private sector needs very much to be coordinated with the big public purchasers. But to your point, are there, are there employers ready to, to head for the hills and get out of this? Absolutely. Because of the reasons that we talked about. I, I, I would say that in my experience, extensive experience with employers, that they are strongly ambivalent about these <laughs> options, the option of giving it to the individual or going with the government. I, I, as I hear it from them, they don't believe that giving the individual will work and they think it will lead to a meltdown. But, but you see, and, and you but let me just finish, Charles. And they don't believe that giving it to the government will work because they don't trust the government. They may think that the government needs to play a stronger role, but they want to be a watchdog on the government and they want a private public partnership where the public doesn't overwhelm the profit because their experience is that's a, a, a recipe for dinner. Yeah, yeah, I know what I just said. That's the old paradigm debate, where the old paradigm debate starts. You know, Medicare for all or turning individuals loose. I'm optimistic, going back to this gentleman's point. There are other labor unions, as I well, uh, Andy Stern, who, who have a slightly different view about the, uh, the dynamic of change. And I'm confident that the American people are getting sufficiently fed up with the lack of uh, cooperation between the parties that I think whoever's elected whether it's McCain or Obama or Clinton, that we have an opportunity once more people understand the facts 
and now the system is not working, you get a breakthrough. But we have to get beyond the sort of, you know, bipolar, in every sense of the term, um, <laughs> starting point and realize it's failing our workers and our economy. Whatever your ideological views are, the system isn't meeting the needs of the 21st century workforce. Yeah. Uh, here's a, a dose of reality. Uh, I mean, it's it's great to hear these fine thoughts. It's, they sound like economists, actually, but uh, you, you know, I was a low. Then you cut off the line. I any employer, uh, if if uh, the Biden bill really got serious next year or any other year, any employer would immediately realize that they don't want to get stuck with a tax bill an uncapped tax bill of up to 26% of their revenues. I think that's what it is. 26% is something. 26% is something. It's 26% of their premium. 26, right. 26% of their premium. They're paying 75, you think? No, no, no. no. You, you're missing the point. Oh, you are missing the point. <laughs> which is that it's an, un, it's an uncapped, it's uncontrollable. When you put it in the hands of somebody else, and I think this is the fear, this is the reason why uh, Andrew's uh, uh, folks want to hold on. It's not because they're do-gooders. It's because they're worried about what the negatives might be if somebody else takes over. Now, I happen to agree with, with Charlie as well that, you, you know, especially the bigger employers are looking at this and saying, well, we failed, so let's see if somebody else will do it. But, uh, you know, nobody's talking about a real solution. They're talking about who's going to pick up the payment rather than how we're going to solve the health care problem. Can I just add one second, and that, just, just briefly on, on the white man, I would just say this. The very reason that that, if you will, business uh, involvement is maintained is because Senator Wyden believes in what, in what Andy and Jared said, and that is he did not want employers to be neutral about health care costs going forward, and he thought they had the best buyers on the planet. And he thought if they're part of the public-private partnership, it's the thinking about the very delivery system reform we all agree has to happen, then you have a better chance of achieving it. Because it's going to take both Medicare and smart private buyers then that cost curve. And that's the key to all of this stuff. Um, I'm Sabelle York and Ways and Means, and I have um, a more granular question <laughs> relating to the state of topics of and, um, and I'm doing something very dangerous, but I'm not allowed to do when I actually work on the other side of the cabinet, which is I'm asking questions which I don't really answer. What, what your answer would be. <laughs> 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 so it's not for me. <laughs> but I think, by virtue of your presentations, um, you are. So, um, we absolutely got very good fish to fry on the cover truck the access front. But one of the things on the cost front that we've been trying to deal with, and we included in a bill last year, and would love to see if there'd be any possibility of peeling it off this year discreetly, but we can only do that with uh, large employers and insurers that, that can take with us. And I think that Jerry's already there, so I'm mostly focusing on Charlie and Andrew. But um, this relates to comparative effectiveness research. And one of the few things that I think there's fairly universal agreement that done right can bring money out of the system while actually improving care. And um, we may not have gotten it perfectly in our bill last year, but we think we did a pretty good job. We had a very, very smart physician working full time on it who was devoted his career to policy. And those of you who do know from a clinical and policy perspective. And, um, but it requires, I think, in that name of a public private partnership, contributions from the major players at the table. So we had public private finance. We had a draw on Medicare trust funds, and we had a very, very nominal, de minimis user fee on the private payers. And we have had uh, an outcry from some in the employer community around the notion, and what we said is that the secretary determines what their fair share is. But if the secretary can't determine it, it's no more than $2 a person a year. So we put that on top of family premiums of averaging twelve dollars or $13,000 a week this year. Doesn't seem like a lot to contribute, and you get big bang for the buck. 
Peter Orzai, the CEO, has said that not surprisingly, the benefits would disproportionately accrue to the employers on this because they would move more quickly with the information to use it than the public programs. So I just want to ask for your support of the partnership and what your position would be uh, in very effective this program where there is shared funding and shared responsibility. Well, I'll go first. Uh, our organization is not a sort of federal public policy. Our work is out in the community at large. But we are, because a pillar of value-based purchasing is information, very supportive of the notion. Uh, and we are frustrated by the fragmented efforts out there in the current system. So, you know, I think from our group, we would find support. How to finance that, I think, is a debatable and granular level issue. But in terms of conceptually, is there a federal government role in comparative effectiveness research as a foundation for value-based purchasing? We would absolutely agree with that. But the granular is what's important here. Because in this year with this dynamic, if we can't get support from everybody about that granular and move it, and I view this as a small, small but really important building block for reform. And taking this off the table now so the research could get started, it's going to be years before it accrues to anything, would be a really nice way to build trust relationships and, more importantly, some cost containment factors for down the road. Uh, so think again, about the brand. I, well, I, I just can't comment on that. You know, part of the frustration with the employer community is that we have a fiscal agent in healthcare. It's called the healthcare plan. We are their customer. A lot of our money goes to the payers. And a lot of our orientation right now is demanding things from healthcare plans that have the contracts with doctors and hospitals that have the information that we need to give to individual employees. So I think, um, again, the plans in general are signed off on this contract. And are willing to pay. Many of them are. Well, but, the but, uh, but I would argue that their money, money is our money. I mean, to get to the granular level issue, they're, they're a fiscal intermediary. I mean, um, you know, their customer and where they get their money is from the employer community. So in a way, you're, you're double dipping if you're asking them for money and you're asking us for no, money. No, they're self-insured plans who are- Self-insured plans, but still have ASO contracts that where, again, um, you know, tremendous dollars are passed through the system. Um, so again, that's the granular level issue where I think you'd have some pushback from the employer community because we have paid. It is our money when you get money from healthcare plan. Thank you, so this is Sibyl. 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 Um, I can't answer your question with the granularity on my part that, that you'd like to hear, but I can suggest two things. Um, first of all, CEE released its report last year. We're going to stay with this issue, and I'm under no illusion that. Uh, Country's going to wake up and say, Yeah, CP got it right. I hope they will, but we hope to be part of the debate. So I will take your idea back among our trustees, and we're going to continue to do a series of forums with other groups on here today with our Better Healthcare Together Coalition to help build the type of education campaign, information campaign that I think has to proceed seriously. <coughs> so my commitment to you is really two things. I'll take this back to our uh, trustees and look for ways to get this issue into the debate. The second thing is I'll also take it to our Better Healthcare Together Coalition. We have not so far gotten into granular details, but we're really focusing on some four very important um, principles that we think are, are key to driving reform. But what you're talking about is exactly, in my view, the type of issue that needs to get to uh, groups like this. And we have the world's largest employer, Walmart, as part of this coalition, SEIU is part of it. And so I don't know where to go. We, we tend not so far to have endorsed specific things. But I think from your point of view, building greater uh, employer and, and labor understanding of where you're going, I think this is a very good start. So I think I can help on those two things. Uh, Joe Minery from the Committee for Economic Development. And I confess that I'm not going to give you a question. I'm I think is an answer uh, to the question Andy asked about why employers have been so passive. Uh, one of the things that we uncovered in our state is that by survey results, 75, probably three quarters of all employers 
provide their employees with no choice of plan. They, there is one plan for all the employees. Now you can take those firms and basically divide them into two groups. One is the group of all but the, the largest firms. And they best basically get muscled by the insurance companies into providing 100% of the firm's business to one company. The reason being that the insurance company doesn't want to be uh, fighting the slice business and they don't want to have their fixed costs divided over only a portion of the employees. If there's only going to be one plan, the only thing that one plan can do is it's got to be the least common denominator across a group of employees who have different preferences. And if you want to make everybody happy, which the employers want to do, that means that you've got to offer as many providers as possible and you're back into the need for services that we're stuck with. If you're looking at the very largest employers, uh, and here, uh, for Andrew Weber, you are absolutely doing the Lord's work in what you're doing, but it is also the work of Sisyphus, because <laughs> if you're trying to make 100% of purchases more efficient, you're putting yourself into a position of hand-to-hand -hand combat with every physician and every provider all the way across the country, and that is that it's a, a massive job, and I think an impossible job to do. But let me just add two more observations. One is that there are two different ways that individual consumers can become involved in making choices in the healthcare market. One way is, as Len suggested earlier, to become your own physician and to choose your own provider for a specific treatment in a specific uh, illness situation. But the other way is to choose your own insurance plan. And that's a much simpler and a much more effective way, I think, for, for individuals to become involved. And on the political acceptance notion, if you ask people what they want, what kind of coverage they want, probably the most common single answer you get is, I want the kind of co coverage that members of Congress get. What members of Congress get is the Federal Employee self benefit Plan, which is a choice of plan from a menu with a regulator to make sure that those choices are, are, are a good range of choices for the individuals. So if political acceptance is the notion, the kinds of structures that Lynn is talking about and the CEE talked about, which are basically like the Federal Employee Self-Benefit Plan, are what people are asking for. Can I respond? Um, point one, there's no question employers are moving to single carriers, but in moving to single carriers, those carriers offer different types of plans. So I do think there is some level of diversity um, in terms of what's being offered to employees, even as they go to single carrier options. Um, in terms of the hand-to-hand -hand combat with the, um, with the provider community, again, I would argue, what is the alternative? hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat with individual consumers. And, and what's interesting to us right now is that, that a lot of physician groups, and particularly primary care physicians, are actually coming to us as purchasers saying, recognizing that we have purchasing authority, saying we need to rethink reimbursement strategies, we need to re reinvent healthcare delivery, we know we need to be doing more for our patients, and, and to get to what Joe said, this conversation, and, and again, my starting position is that there is a tremendous opportunity in the transformation of the healthcare delivery system to uh, uh, better control costs and improve quality. And my only question is, who are going to be the levers to make that happen? We cannot rely on a provider-based system um, uh, to sort of do it on their own as part of medical professionalism. I do believe the demand side, the purchaser side, has to exert influence and in conversation with providers, rethink the healthcare delivery system and how we pay for healthcare. And I think, again, my, and a lot of people disagree with it, that the employers have to be an important party at that table. That's simply what I'm saying. Hi, Joy Wilson with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Medicaid has not been mentioned. And, uh, I mentioned it. Well, enhanced state, uh, enhanced public program, I heard, but 
Uh, I guess my question to all of you is, what do you see the state role in this new thing, uh, both on the service delivery side and on the finance? Well, there are uh, a number of options on that front, and, and the reason it wasn't mentioned in this paper is because I promised to get out of here in less than two hours, right? <laughs> but really, um, I think uh, one option is is uh, always going to be present, or, or one reality will be present. Anything we do at the national level is going to be in partnership with the state to some dimension. You might have heard this rumor, all healthcare markets are local just like politics, and I think you'll see as the uh, bills go forward and become more real as, as time passes, if we do indeed have an adult conversation next year, which I think we will, you'll see a lot of talk and a lot of interest in state flexibility and sort of, you know, allowing various uh, um, things within a framework probably that will come uh, with the legislation. But, um, I think there are two stark views of the Medicaid uh, situation. One would be, you know, it works well in some states, so let's leave it alone. Another would be, it works really badly in a number of states. It underpays and because the legislators won't let it pay, and so they have no trouble getting access. Well, some people would say it's actually more progressive than mainstream Medicaid and bring it all into the new system. And some would say, no, let's just patch it up. And I think that debate is in some ways uh, an important sub-element of the bigger debate. But I don't think anybody up here will forget the fact that we have to think about our most vulnerable. That's part of why we're in this business. If I could just add, I think the states have played an extremely important and influential role over the past number of years uh, in uh, tackling these problems at the local level. And they've made much more progress than has happened uh, in Washington. Uh, even though huge change has, you know, has come close to a well mature plan of state. And I think that's going to continue to be the case, but um, I think that we really shouldn't see the states as being the primary area because it's not the most effective area to be doing this. I think we need to look at creating national structures to do it. And I want to thank Sabelle for kind of getting us to brass tacks, but also because she makes a point that comparative effectiveness, but you could say IT, you could say information about quality measures are important building blocks. That's the stage we're in in terms of this transformation, and that is much better done uh, at a national basis. And uh, implicit in what Sabelle says, and I want to just make this point directly, is that this should not be a year off where, you know, where we do, where we do sort of nice policy debates. We ought to try to get some things done this year so that we can put them on the road. It is going to take many years to make, have these things have an impact. We need to get them started. Let's do uh, two or three or four of these things, even if we do them at a very modest level, so that we can start the ball rolling forward. It will take some pressure off the enormously complex problem we're going to have next year. I'd like to try to make a couple of comments and questions. One, to lose to what you just said, the pace of change is going to be incremental. I don't think we're going to see anything very fast anytime soon. Second one, to sort of address this, with comparative effectiveness and law, something that CMS cannot do, the private plans can do. You can have all the comparative effectiveness studies that you want, but doctors still in the end make a decision. Private plans can tell a doctor, we don't want to do business with you because your research utilization is off the charts. Congress has not empowered CMS to do that. Most of the people I pose this question to say, well, we're going to go as an incentive, but sooner or later, you just have to be able to tell us, you're out of here. So they can do it with the business plans, they can do it with Part D plans, but they'll understand why the small medical practices on the side are saying this. The question that I have is, I'm under the impression that health insurance is regulated on a state level. If that's so, would it possibly introduce economies of scale to just make the state regulation of health insurance and allow insurers to negotiate their contracts on regional scales? You might argue that the employers can do this negotiating power. However, before all, we're talking about the employers getting together to have negotiating power. I don't see the difference. Well, our Fed model, the Federal Reserve model, is the part of what you're talking about. Uh, regulatory structures to deal with 
the concerns that I raised. So, yes. I think you could change the you know, regulatory model for insurance, but only when you have a replacement uh, ready to go. Um, right now, states <coughs> play a very useful, important role as being public watchdogs on how uh, healthcare operates. You might argue that some of the things like mandates are, you know, it's excessive or whatever, but they play a watchdog role, a role that the federal government largely has advocated over the last 20 years. And that's a problem. We need to get government back in a strong, a balanced role, but a strong role here to make things work. Because if we don't, we don't have another way to do it. Any more questions? Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.